Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. A man received a call from his wife as she was about to fly home from Europe. How's my cat? She asked. It's dead. Oh, honey, she insisted. Don't be so honest. Why didn't you break the news to me slowly? You've ruined my trip. What do you mean, he asked. Well, she said, you could have told me that he was on the roof. When I called from Paris, you could have told me he was acting sluggish. Then when I called from London, you could have said he was sick. And when I called from New York, you could have said he was at the vet. Then, when I arrived home, you could have said he was dead. This was a new way to communicate for the husband. Okay, he said, I'll do better next time. By the way, she asked, how's mom? There was a long silence. Then he replied, uh, she's on the roof. Some people don't really want the truth. Some people can't handle the truth. And some people get angry over the truth. In Matthew 13, verse 45 and 46, Jesus shares a couple of parables on the kingdom about the reception of the greatest of all truths. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What benefit can we glean from this parable? The pearl of great price after our song. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prayers of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and for content on. In 1940, Canadian geologist John Williamson was working in Tanzania. One day, while slipping and sliding along a rain-soaked road in a deserted area, his four-wheel drive vehicle sank up to its axles in mud. Pulling out his shovel, Dr. Williamson began digging out of the mud hole. After digging clumsily for a while, he uncovered something strange. 
a pink-like stone. As a geologist, naturally curious about rock formations, he picked it up and wiped away the mud. The more mud he removed, the more excited he became and could hardly believe what he saw. When the stone was finally clean, Dr. Williamson was beside himself with joy. He had just discovered a diamond. And not just any diamond. Dr. Williamson found the famous pink diamond of Tanzania that now sits in the royal scepter of Great Britain. Since that time, the Williamson mine in Tanzania, South Africa, has pronounced, produced rather over 19 million carats, over 8,000 pounds of diamonds. Acquiring pearls is a different story. And long ago, pearl hunting often cost men their lives. The tools of the trade for pearl hunters were a rope and a rock. See, a pearl diver used a huge rock attached to his body to lower himself into the oyster beds. Just getting to the pearl exposed him to potential attacks from sharks, moray eels, and other sea creatures. The diver then had to scour the sandy bottom below, hunting for oysters. But finding an oyster did not uh, guarantee finding a pearl. In fact, the diver would often go through a thousand oysters to find one pearl. Meanwhile, the pearl hunter had to be careful to hold his breath, lest he end up drowning. No wonder pearls were so valuable. The Jewish Talmud said, pearls are beyond price. The Egyptians and Romans went so far as to worship the pearl. I understand that when a Roman emperor wanted to show how rich he was, he would dissolve pearls in vinegar and then drink them in his wine. In much the same way, a millionaire might light his cigar using a $100 bill. We see why Jesus used the pearl as an object of high value. Jesus said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Jesus is saying the world can be divided into two kinds of people. Those who, like this businessman, know something of worth when they see it. And those who, like pigs, cannot tell the difference between pearls and peanuts. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verse 6, Jesus advised, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. When we're worldly-minded, we can be as clueless as a brute boar. We fail to separate the priceless from the worthless. Even God's people, unfortunately, have had this problem. The prophet relays God's frustration in Malachi chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept this ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? The first problem with this take on serving God is the emphasis of what's in it for me. Selfishness is an early symptom of spiritual sickness. Even if we did not personally benefit, God deserves our devotion. God is worthy of our worship. We owe God homage. Modern religion, sadly, is too often man-centered. When Jesus said, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, I'm reminded of the prophet's rebuke in Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I suppose it's been this way in every age. Man can get so turned around that he doesn't know up from down, light from dark. How sad when so many say no to Jesus, no to the church, no to the truth of the gospel, no to the kingdom of heaven. Not only are men indifferent to the pearl of great price, but some even attack those who would lead them to this most precious treasure. Back to our text. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price. Collectors make it their business to understand the value of rare 
and unusual objects. Like many others, I'm fascinated by arrowheads, old coins, Civil War artifacts, and antique cars. The point Jesus makes is that not everyone recognizes the value of veritable treasures, but you make sure you're like the merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Recognize the pearl of great price. A headline in the Nashville Tennessean in February of 2007 read, the old adage, one man's trash is another man's treasure, took on new meaning and a sick feeling of regret for a couple who donated a rolled up parchment document to a Nashville thrift store last year, only to find out this week that it was a rare copy of the Declaration of Independence worth six figures. It was one of 200 copies commissioned by John Quincy Adams in 1820 when he was Secretary of State and printed by William Stone in 1823. I bought it at a yard sale about 10 years ago in Donaldson Hills, I think, said Stan Cappy, a pipe fitter who described himself as the idiot who donated that declaration you wrote about. Cappy read in Thursday's Tennessean that Michael Sparks bought the declaration from the thrift store for $2.48 and is ready to auction it off for $250,000 or more. When Cappy heard the story, he knew it was the document he gave away. I look for odd and old things at sales and probably paid about what he did for it, he said, adding that he hung it up in his garage just as a decorative piece for most of the 10 years he had it. Cappy's wife, Linda, pushed him to clean out the garage. The best I can recall, we had a little debate about whether to keep it or to donate it, and she won. Amazingly, men react to the truth of the gospel as differently as these men reacted to this valuable document. Some get it, and some do not. Let's talk a little more about pearls. One difference between the man who found the Declaration of Independence copy and the merchant man seeking goodly pearls is that when the merchant man found it, he sold all that he had to acquire it. He didn't trade it in for cash. He loved the pearl itself. It held great sentimental value, and he was prepared to give everything he had up to acquire it. There are four categories of pearls that a man may acquire today. There are imitation pearls, fakes, counterfeits, cheap copies, a dime a dozen. The world today, like swine, does not distinguish between the real deal and the worthless imitation. They value substitutes as highly as a precious pearl. They see the party scene as a precious, precious pearl, drugs, alcohol, fornication, adultery, homosexuality. The world chooses financial success over faithfulness to God. And if we're not careful, we can covet secular learning over the knowledge of Christ, the honor and praise of men over the praise of God. Jesus says as much of religious leaders in his day in John 12, 43. Satan plants many imitation pearls cheap substitutes for what really satisfies, for what really lasts, that one pearl of great price. Next, there are cultured pearls or artificial pearls. Now, artificial pearls are of greater value than imitation pearls. Cultured pearls are not wholly man-made like imitation pearls. Those who market cultured pearls speak so disparagingly about imitation pearls that you would think cultured pearls are natural, that they're the products of God and oysters without the touch of man. But in fact, cultured pearls are made in part by oysters, in part by man. By actually inserting a foreign object into the tissue of an oyster or mollusk, pearl farmers can induce the creation of a pearl. These, of course, have a certain attraction, but they're only a small fraction of the value of natural pearls. Cultural pearls represent human-tainted religion. They have a form of godliness, as Paul puts it, 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. 
They have an outward semblance of spiritual beauty, but they're not the ultimate. Men market their own version of Jesus, of the church, of the gospel, and of heaven. And these are often more palatable, more attractive to his fellow man. But if a man settles for any of these in the end, they'll see they've fallen short. Then there are natural pearls, things that have great value, family, rest, recreation, education, good citizenship, hard work. Each of these categories represent that which is inherently good, but none of them are the pearl of great price. Nothing wrong with any of these, but we must not stop here. Some are so content with these temporal blessings that they never find the pearl of great price. Many of them never even make the search. And finally, there is the pearl of great price. What is the pearl of great price? This is a natural pearl, but it's set apart from all other natural pearls. This pearl is more beautiful and larger than all other pearls. It's in a class of its own. In that sense, it's like the massive diamond John Williamson found in Tanzania. So what was Jesus referring to when he spoke of this pearl of great price? There are several possibilities that are really interwoven and interrelated. Jesus is certainly the pearl of great price. Paul got it. He understood. He knew what was most valuable, and his response to this pearl mirrors Jesus' parable. We read in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Think about it. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. John begins his gospel. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. When Thomas finally accepted the reality of Jesus' re resurrection, he cried out to Jesus in John 20, verse 28, my Lord and my God. This was, as John the Baptist expressed it, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Oh yes, Jesus is the pearl of great price. But at the same time, the church is the pearl of great price. Jesus, you see, links himself to the church. Some who highly prize Christ, sadly despise his bride, the church. Well, don't make that mistake. In Matthew 16, verse 18, we get a glimpse into how highly Jesus esteemed the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Paul charged the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 28, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The Holy Spirit drives home further the great value of the church to some of the same brethren in Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 23. There the Bible says, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. How highly do you value the church? Do you cherish it as a pearl of great price? Do you talk of it as if it is that great pearl? Do you support it with faithful attendance at its assemblies? Some say yes to Jesus and no to the church. Oh, yes, the church is a pearl of great price. Before you slight the church, consider that God's word says that the church, in Hebrews 12, verse 23, that the general assembly and church of the firstborn are registered in heaven. In a general sense, one could certainly say that 
Biblical truth in general is the pearl of great price. You can't say yes to Jesus and then ignore some of the great truths that he reveals. Proverbs 23, verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Remember this, whenever you find the truth of God's word, latch on to it, seize it, make whatever sacrifices are required to uphold it and live it out. And you will never regret it. The truth is so significant that it is linked to Jesus in a special way. You remember in 1 John 4, verse 8, how the Bible tells us God is love? No doubt about that. But the Apostle John also tells us in his gospel that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus tells Pilate how central the truth is to his mission. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. John 18, 37. Oh, friend, be sure to buy the truth and sell it not. For the truth is the pearl of great price. You shall know the truth, Jesus says, and the truth shall make you free. The Holy Spirit adds in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Thy word is truth. The truth of God's word sanctifies us. It, it makes us holy. It separates us from everything and everyone else. Jesus tells us in John 4 that God is looking for true worshipers. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For our worship to be accepted by God, it must mirror the worship found in the New Testament. Buy the truth and sell it not. Others fall in love with the truth initially, as illustrated by the rocky ground in the parable of the sower, only to fumble it away when the truth becomes inconvenient. Oh, don't let that happen. According to the Apostle Paul in Romans 1.25, these kind of people suppress the truth and unrighteousness and change or exchange the truth of God for a lie. One of the most pitiful scriptures in the Bible is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning with verse 10. There the Bible says, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Oh, friend, avoid this path. Be like the merchant who goes to whatever trouble is necessary to find and secure the pearl of great, great price, who went and sold all that he had and bought it. Isn't it true that a good leader would only ask of others that which he was willing to do himself? You know, this merchant man's determination to find and secure the pearl of great price reflects the very heart of Jesus for the soul drowning in a sea of sin. Your heart, your soul, your life is so precious to Jesus. He gave it all up for you. He gave it all up for me. We'll close with the words found in Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's how far Jesus went to save your soul. Will you demonstrate the same kind of sacrificial devotion in securing the pearl of great price? Jesus, the church, the truth. We'll be back for a final word after our song. Lord, I come to your fold for this world.
People lie, riches fade in this world of decay. Lord, I long to behold something true. Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We pray you've heard God speak to you through His Word. You can call us to receive a free copy of this sermon, number 1381, The Pearl of Great Price. We also offer the Truth Freeze Bible Study Course, a six-lesson Bible course that you can take at home, and there's no charge for that. Visit LetTheBibleSpeak.com to watch video, hear audio, or read transcripts of the program. On behalf of the congregations listed shortly, we say with the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and may God bless you.